All right, let's get started then. Welcome to Global Diversity CFP Day. I'm very impressed that you made it <laughs> this hour on a Saturday morning. Um, so first off, I would like to thank our sponsors. Uh, you're at Microsoft. They generously sponsored the venue. Uh, and then they've been like a longtime sponsor of various community events, including like meetups and Singapore JS, if you don't know, uh, for a long time was hosted here in Microsoft. And then this, this, in this very room, it was actually when Microsoft first hosted Singapore JS, and then the group outgrew, and then they moved us down to the auditorium, and then Singapore JS moved to PayPal, but now they're back at Microsoft for this month anyway. So thank you, Microsoft. Um, and then later on, we'll have lunch um, for free, uh, thanks to Python user group Singapore, Pugs, um, and Elisha Tan. So Martin is from Python user group. Do you want to talk about the group? Yeah, OK, I can say a few words. So good morning, everyone. So the Python user group Singapore is a registered society. And we did that, <coughs> Elon, how long ago? Six, eight years? Uh, nine, nine years, probably. We did that mainly so that we can organize Python APEC, so that we can have a bank account and can collect money from investors. Uh, from, uh, <laughs> 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 so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and basically, um, the people who run the group is usually a small group of six to eight people or so. Um, and we also organize the monthly meetups. So when you go to meetup.com, uh, Singapore Python user group, um, actually, the next meetup will be at the end of this month. I haven't put it up yet, uh, but I found a venue already. Um, so that's what we do. We organize the meetups, we organize PyCons almost every year, and uh, basically, for now, that's, that's what we do. And the next PyCon is happening? The next PyCon is happening uh, this year, May 31st, very soon. And we the need, CFP we is need CFPs. <laughs> that's why I'm here today. Oh, yeah, I should probably explain what CFP is. It's called for proposals in case you don't already know. So it's basically something that you write up about a talk you want to give and plus who you are to help the conference, the conference organizer to decide, okay, we want to bring you on as a speaker or not. Is that right? Correct. Cool. And another launch sponsor is an individual, Elisha Tan. She's a lady who runs Tech Ladies Meetup Group in Singapore. Um, she's awesome. She forked out money from her own pocket to help us you know, bring lunch for everybody. So thank you, Pugs and Elisha. Um, last sponsor, but not the least, is uh, Engineer Sashi. So this is what happened last night. <laughs> I was looking for their logo on the internet. And these are all <laughs> what Google gives me. And this one I cropped out of their previous recording. So I'm not sure um, which one is their real logo. but. They're all the same. Oh, that's one more. Uh, <laughs> they're all the same. They're awesome. They go around recording tech events happening in Singapore. Um, uh, thank you, Michael. Michael, you want to say a few words about Engineer Saw SG? Uh, we are looking for volunteers. If you would like to help us, we would be glad to train you and teach you how to do this with us. Of course, it won't be as complex as what I have now today, but um, it's, it's close. It's close. <laughs> so you will, you will learn to operate all these cool e equipments and learn their names. Like, you know, I probably just know that's a video camera. Those are mics. But you will learn more about that. So join engineers.sg. They're a great initiative. Um, yeah, also, like, if you miss any like, uh, engineering community related events, um, and just check engineers.sg, and chances are they have it recorded there. Cool. Most importantly, thank you all, and then welcome again. So the goal of today's workshop is straightforward. If you've never become, uh, if you've never been a conference speaker before, we're going to make you one today. And then if you have spoken at any conferences before, and today you're just gonna work on your next conference proposal, and you know stand on the stage again sometime. Um, I'm your host. I'm Lu Wei. I thought you had a question. Um, I've been an engineer for uh, six years. Uh, I worked from I worked in like a web consultancy company, and then I built a uh, cryptocurrency wallet. Uh, and then most recently, I was with 
Quantcast, which was an online advertising company uh, for the last three years. Um, so let me start you off with a story. Um, my first job was at Pivotal Labs Singapore. So six months into you know, my first job out of college, my manager walked up to me and then said, do you want to give a talk at Red Dot RubyConf? I was like, me? Really? Well, what am I even going to talk about in front of 250 professionals? Remember, I was like a fresh grad, only worked for six months. And my manager was like, don't worry about it, I'll help you. So he did. He helped me with brainstorming uh, a talk topic while we went through a couple, and then he helped me settle on one. He even helped me take photos that I ended up using in my slides. So just like that, I became a conference speaker at Red Dot RubyConf 2012, and that was six years ago. Since then, I spoke at um, RubyConf Taiwan, RubyConf China, JSConf Asia, CampJS in Australia, a uh, Bitcoin conference in Beijing, uh, and also I was even invited as a guest lecturer in SMU. So all of this started with my manager approached me and asked me to become a conference speaker. Um, so when Global Diversity CFE Day organizer Peter Atkin um, approached me with the idea of this workshop, I thought back to how my manager made me a conference speaker and how scary it was. It was hard to make up your mind to become a conference speaker and also put in all this work to make it happen. And nobody should really do it alone. So that's why we're all here. We're going to help each other. Um, we're going to make this happen. So we have an excellent panel of past conference speakers and conference organizers today with us. And they're going to share with us their experiences as well as their advices in how to become a conference speaker. All right, welcome. Sayani, Ginny, um, Roland, and Martin. All right. Hey, sit in the middle. <laughs> All right, I'll take the other seat then. It's definitely the cable here. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Every time I walk past it. Oh, maybe that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, how about we start with introductions of who you are, which conferences you've spoken at, and then like what kind of uh, conference or meetups you organize here in Singapore? <laughs> Hi, I'm Roland. Uh, my day job is as Chief Privacy Officer for an LX company. I work in uh, privacy, data protection, and infosec. Outside of that, I'm a founding member of Hackerspace, an organizer of Force Asia, and various other many other tech community pieces. Um, I don't remember when I first spoke at a conference. Um, it's, it's, it's been too long. It's, yeah, that, yeah. And, and it's sort of public speaking has been part of what I've done since a fairly young age, uh, including like radio station stuff when I was about 15. So um, it, the, it was not ever that, it was never an obvious problem. It was more like, okay, I've got to write a, CFP, write a proposal in response to a CFP. Well, let's look at some other ones. <laughs> And see what they look like. Yeah, um, I was going to make you speak up. It was very quiet up there. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> valid point. Despite all the amazing noise. Um, so, concretely, uh, Linux Comp Australia and Foss Asia. I specifically recall uh, speaking out that are relevant to this. Um, and of course, um, an organizer of Foss Asia. Cool. Okay. Hi, my name is Martin. <coughs> um, I came to Singapore eight years ago and I visited PyCon APEC. That was PyCon APEC and my mind was blown. It was my first conference ever. I mean, PyCon is really small in Singapore. It's 200 to 300 people, but for me it was still really motivating and inspiring event. And I decided, okay, next year I want to give a talk. So next year I submitted a CFP and I luckily got selected and I gave my first talk. So that's how I got it. That was my first talking experience. Uh, and then after that I decided, hmm, that giving a talk was a cool thing. Next year I'm going to organize the whole conference. <laughs> and I've been doing that ever since. So yeah, helping hands are always needed. So if you really want to do this, you can do it immediately. Like, there's always a shortage of conference organizers and helpers. It's very easy to get into this. Um, personally, I, I run a web agency here in Singapore. It's called BitLab Studio. 
So I build websites with Python and Django, hence I organize PyCons because I use Python every single day of my life since nine years now. Um, more JavaScript these days because of React.js and stuff. Um, yeah, so that's what I do uh, as my full-time job. So but you skipped the part. Did the conference actually bring you to Singapore? Um, you moved here because you No, I came to Singapore um, and fell in love, and then I kind of had to settle here. It was so love. Yeah, it was love. Um, <laughs> meetups, I organize, as I said earlier, I organize the Python user group meetups every month, and I have also started a meetup called Singapore Django Notes because mm -hmm. I use Django very much, but that meetup usually... I'm the only one who suggests talks, and if I don't have time to come up with new slides, then there will be no meetup for a long period. So we basically only have like two meetups per year currently. So if there are any Django developers in the room and you want to give a talk, just walk up to me. And <laughs> and it's definitely a good first experience. <coughs> give a talk at a meetup first, and then give a talk at a conference. It's a nice testing ground. Hi, I'm Sayani. I work in uh, embedded Linux on IoT gateways uh, that connects to energy infrastructure at day job. I uh, dabbled a lot with web technologies. Uh, that was not how I started my career 10 years ago. I came from electrical engineering, so that was like a career change. But uh, I love the point that uh, Roland made. Uh, public speaking has been a big part of my, or rather a part of my life ever since I was young. Because, uh, whether my mom uh, trained me in uh, recitation competitions uh, when you're four or five years old, and or as a prefect, you know, when you have to like go and MC on the stage. But uh, then when I came into the web dev and the open source world, the tech conference was still slightly different. I mean, I was glad that I had the public speaking experience. And then of course, uh, for a while I was part of Toastmasters. So I think um, one thing I would love to share with all of you is how public speaking as a general life skill uh, can be very useful for any individual. Uh, plus, if you are a developer uh, or a designer, tech person, uh, bring tech conferences into your uh, daily life. So I've been part of, um, after coming into the tech community, I've been part of many conferences. Uh, I've uh, spoken uh, in Europe, uh, tech conferences, or even in uh, local conferences, as MCs as well as uh, event organizers. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share and uh, say that uh, I think public speaking is a great life skill. So, uh, whether it's <laughs> one single <laughs> card. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Can I get rid of this mic? <laughs> Is that easier? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is it one of these two there? <laughs> okay. Whoa, no. it's there. It's, there. it's not it's fixed. There. We are not using the speakers. We're not muted. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. So is it the two mics next to the desk? Is it the bottle? Yeah, is this the bottle one? Can I just get rid of this one? Yeah, maybe you can try that. Okay. Let's see. On. See, this is why you need training for this stuff. Engineers.sg. Okay, that's not the on button. All right. It's not there. Oh, the on. Okay, it's not this one. All right. It seemed to have gone. Yeah. So um, it's gone. Okay. Yeah. So make public speaking a life skill, part of your life, and uh, speak at conferences, speak at meetups, speak as MCs. Many opportunities. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Sani. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ginny. Um, I in my day job, I work at Carousel, um, uh, an engineering manager there. Um, and my first speaking experience was 10 years ago. <laughs> Long yeah. time. So um, I first spoke at uh, Force.my mm -hmm. um, 10 years ago, that was back in 2008. Um, and how I got um, involved was um, one of the organizers actually approached me and, and said that, hey, you know, we want to look for more diverse um, top people, uh, people to talk on diverse topics. Um, and at the time, um, they wanted to uh, they wanted to talk about uh, Mac OS from uh, open source from a Mac OS perspective. And um, back then, the Mac community was very small; it's very few people. And I happened to be one of them, and that was how I got invited, and that was how I got started. Um, in between, 
um, 2008 to last year, um, I didn't do any conference talks, but I did quite a number of um, meetup talks. Uh, and last year, I decided to basically um, share a story, a, a very personal story about what happened to me the year before that. Um, and how accessibility, which has increasingly becoming a very pet topic for me, um, is, in, uh, is important. And um, it was actually Sayani who actually helped me to get back into the speaking circuit last year. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think I also have Sayani to thank for <laughs> just one year. My name suddenly just like came to like Thomas, the GS Conference Asia's organizers radar. Somehow, someone nominated <laughs> me to speak at that conference. So you also apparently to speak at a conference, you also need a friend like Sayani. Yeah. Uh, Secretly. To just like put you out there. It's like yeah. you go now, give a talk. So hopefully we can help one another do that. Yeah, yeah. do that. Um, so, so if you get invited <coughs> to speak, maybe it's Sayana. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, I have a reputation. Yeah, now in Arab. The secret's out. <laughs> so, so like, great. So then uh, we, they all, we all share like how we kind of got it started on our first conference talk. But then like for me, it's always the fear. Like even today, I, when I was standing on like, oh my God, am I really doing this, right? So like this fear of, am I good enough? Like how do you, you know, get over that and invite? I never have much useful advice on that front. Um, I've always been fairly outspoken, so that's, that's never a, uh, a strong inhibitor. Uh, one thing that, in fact, as uh, Tim pointed out, uh, sometimes it's necessary to remember to keep my voice loud. And so for that, if that's your concern, then I have a concrete tip, which is go and do it in a car park. Yell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, find a field or a car park, right? and just do your talk without an audience, screaming at the top of your lungs. Take this show. It then gets much easier <laughs> to do it, uh, to sort of come back down to a conversational tone, but not mumbling in front of an audience. But yeah, that other half of the question, kind of. But still, that, you know, like just kind of giving the talk out loud somewhere, right? And then just, it's a good start, just somehow knowing there's nobody there listening, or potentially someone hiding in their car. But, you know, I guess that's a good start. Um, fear. I guess it comes down to preparation. If you're prepared, you have nothing to fear. So when I give a talk, I train the talk two times at home. So yeah, and, and, and my talks are usually very hands-on. I have maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm crazy. It's, it's quite a risk <laughs> because when you type, when you code live, everything can break, right? So, um, but I, I kind of like to show code, and uh, so I train the whole thing, right? I, every slide just has a few words, so I need to speak on my own. I cannot read from the slide, and, um, and I prepare all the code. Usually I can copy and paste the code from the slide into the terminal, mm -hmm. and I try that two times. If it works two times in a row, then there's no bugs in the code, and I know that I can repeat this on a live audience. Live coding is hard. Yeah, it's, it's hard, but it's, I think but it's the most fun. <laughs> Um, the fear right at the event, you need training, I guess. Just um, do, do it more, huh? Um, I think I've given maybe 20 talks or so in my life and I still get, uh, my heartbeat goes up right before and I have to sit down and go to the toilet and then I have <laughs> to drink and then, you know, breathe a little bit. But once you start talking, usually the fear disappears and you start, you know, focusing on your slides and the code and you don't even look at the people anymore. And then, I mean, if you're prepared and you know that what you're showing is somehow useful, <coughs> you'll get through it easily. But the fear, I mean, it's, maybe it's part of the fun. <laughs> it's some, it's you know, adrenaline. It's some adrenaline that gets yeah. released into your body and uh, it's a kick that you can get. And you just have to get used to it by doing it over and over again. There's no way to really shut it off. How many of you are fearful of public speaking? Put up your hands. It was like, you know, top list, 10 top list of fears or something like that, like public speaking was the first yeah, one. Yeah, your, ni always, your right? nightmare is always used as like in front of a group of people. Yeah, right? right? So it is normal. <laughs> it is fear of public speaking is normal. But I would really emphasize what Martin said, preparation and training. There is no substitute for it. That's what I would say that if you're here to submit for one particular mm -hmm. conference, that's great. But make public speaking as part of your life, whether it's like a exercise, you know, eating healthy, it's part of your life. The other thing I would say that um, in terms of training, 
pick smaller uh, audiences like meetup groups. I think Singapore has such an amazing developer community with such friendly uh, people like you know Roland uh, Martin who have organized uh, meetups and conferences, uh, hackerspaces. Go and speak there. That's a great training ground and get feedback from the audience. Join Toastmasters. Simple things such as pass fillers. You know, like notice how many of us, even us sitting here and we say the word um or you know. So I just said once, just last <laughs> sentence. Trails Masters will help you pick up all these things. And lastly, I think it's the advice that I started giving recently last year is this, like when you are out there, there's a psychological bias called spotlight effect. You think that the whole world is looking at you and if there's one mistake, you know, they're gonna pin you down. Really, the world does not care that much. There are probably like 20 speakers in that conference. You made that one mistake, nobody cares. I know you will not think that way, but I've started telling uh, people this, that make your talk topic much bigger than who you are. Let's say you created a website for, say, uh, accessibility for eyes for blind people, like something that Jeannie did. The topic of blind people must be shared so much and is so bigger than who I am or what I am that it should propel you to share that topic much bigger than your fear. So make that topic much bigger than who you are. Like uh, even though you're fearing, you're crushing, you're like, no, the world needs to hear this because there are people out there that will benefit. So make it bigger than you practice, make it bigger than you and uh, make it part of your lifestyle. That's very good point. Um, yeah, I know I concur with pretty much what everyone has said. Um, I think preparation is key. So when I was preparing for my talk, um, I basically, um, first I drafted my, I did my slides and then I drafted what I'm actually going to say. And this is one thing that's really nice and you should actually put it as one of your mm. arsenal. Um, most modern presentation software actually has presented slides, presenter notes and presenter mode when you actually present it on stage. So I actually wrote out my entire speech in the presenter notes for every slide, just in case I get so nervous that I forget what I'm supposed to say, I, can some, I have something to fall back that doesn't look like I'm just reading from the screen, mm -hmm. right? Oops, I think I got the screen. <laughs> your, your hand signals. Again. <laughs> I might just be my computer. Again, again, yeah, yeah, timing. Yeah. yeah Continue. Timing. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> and the thing is, um, like what Sayani said also, you know, have somebody to practice with. In fact, I practice with Sayani. <laughs> Uh, and I also concur with what she said, you know, make the talk bigger than what you are. In my case, my talk was actually about accessibility, like, uh, like what she mentioned. And to me, as much as I was nervous, to me, I felt like getting this message out was more important than how nervous I felt. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, a lot of preparation. Um, presenter notes. And... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's that's a good point. Preparation definitely. Just like the a lot of the nervousness comes from us like, oh, I'm not well yeah. prepared enough yeah. and then having knowing that okay, I've done all that I could, yeah. which is never uh and, is and never guess, enough. Yeah, and I guess but the other thing also is um nervousness. There's two parts to nervousness for when you're giving a talk. One is when you're giving the talk itself. The second part is during the, the Q&A. Oh. Uh, yeah. oh, yeah, we're, we're going to get to Q&A yeah. later on. Uh, let's start with like, the very first stage yeah. of, of becoming a speaker. Cool. Um, oh, yeah, and the content of the talk. Yes, like it's bigger than who we are, but it doesn't always have to be something as noble as accessibility. Yeah. Like there's no topic that's too small. That's, yeah. It's just like you can talk about Standard Challenge. semicolons, which happened in the last year. Even a Hello Asia. World project, because there are other beginners out there, yeah. you know. That, exactly. That, so there's always somebody out there that will need your topic. Exactly. So then, and then you, you might think that's another thing. Is like you might think, oh, I'm I'm a beginner myself. Who am I to give a talk, right? But the thing is, that's what people can relate to. That's what my manager told me. It's like. Yes, you, you, you're new in this thing, but then there are many other people who are just like you, who want to hear from someone who just got started and then hear about their experience and all that. So it's valuable. Whatever you have to say, it's something 
that someone in this crowd is going to benefit from. You have to believe that. That is true. And it took me <laughs> so long to learn that as well. Cool. So now let's talk about CFPs. Sounds like all of you have written CFPs? Uh, written proposals. Proposals. All right. <laughs> yes. So. <laughs> I was because like my part of the question is like if you've never written a CFP, how do you get out of it? Because that would be you know great if you don't have to write a CFP since we've all written CFPs. So um, do you have any advice or on um, what makes a good CFP? Uh, have you ever been rejected? And then what did you learn from that rejection? Can, can I take the second one, the one that you did not write a CFP? I did a few times, but maybe okay. I'll, I'll go. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so this is the point of view where you do not give a CFP. So I will say my first international conference where I was invited to speak was never through a CFP. In fact, both the international conferences, I'm just way too lazy. But this is where, <laughs> this is where I say that uh, it's not just about one conference. Because I was doing a screencast before, which is in a way like public speaking, I used to share and do a video. A lot of viewers saw me uh, sharing technical topics, and I also also used to write technical topics, and I used to MC in uh, tech, tech conferences. So there are other ways to get invited as a speaker, either through your demos or other public speaking areas, other than uh, the traditional way. So I don't know, like maybe, keep keep doing your. Maybe it's hard to find though, right? I mean, unless you are in fact the conference organizer. Yes, uh, I guess, yeah, but I, I guess for me it was just a screencast that I used to do like religiously every week and that's where people heard me speak and they were like, okay, I want you in a conference. Yeah, okay. So that's another way of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I've heard from our last run of this workshop, like, I think it was Hui Jing who mentioned that you have to like write and she keeps a technical blog so, oh. so that people get your yeah. name out there so then you'll get invited into conferences. Mm -hmm. That's definitely one way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else? I, well, apart from run a conference is a pretty extreme way to avoid writing a proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you do it at, in my case, Foss Asia scale. Um, the, what makes a good proposal, however, um, so I am involved in, I'm not involved in the writing the CFP at Foss Asia, but I am involved in assessing the proposals that come back. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so nice. there's really two things that I look for when I'm assessing a proposal. <coughs> One is, what is this speaker proposing to speak about? This sounds like a self-evidently stupid question, but a solid 10-20% of proposals that we receive, it is not at all clear what the speaker is proposing to speak about. They're speaking about who they are, they're speaking about a project that they know some people who worked on, but haven't actually said what they're talking about. It's like, well, okay, that's a bit hard. Um, and then the other is the, who the speaker is to be speaking about that topic. And I don't mean to get into sort of political correctness and, and sort of keeping in the lane type stuff, but more, um, if you're going to talk about a particular, let's in Fossa, this case, a particular open source project, and you're not going to tell the conference organizers in your proposal what your involvement in that project is, and in my case, where I was charging around in mountainous areas in, in Australia, with limited connectivity and no mains power. So I was running off battery when I had an hour to look at it. I was not in a position to do the background research. So I, I, was, I went through 20 or 30 proposals and at least five of them. I had, my feedback was, I can't work out who this person is and I haven't got the hour, just because of the timeline issues, to work out who this person is. So in, in most occasions where a, a conference organizer issues a CFP, they will ask you two things. One, what are you talking about? And two, who are you, your bio? And in, the, in that second piece, it is really important to help the organizers understand the connection between what you're talking about and who you are. If it's just, if this is an interesting thing that you find interesting and you'd like to talk about, but you have no particular contribution to that thing, then for a conference organizer who has a pile of proposals, like, well, uh, probably not. So those, those two things. Make, you know, think, work out, and this is to take a step backwards, work out what you're going to talk about and whether that it's as large as, as solving a problem for an entire class of, of people with a uh, visual or auditory or other problem, or whether it's um, a better cut at hello world in, yeah. in language X, which yeah, turns out not to be as obvious as it sounds. Mm. Understand what you're going to say to your audience, 
communicate that clearly in both your talk topic and in more detail in the abstract and communicate who you are to be talking about that. That's, uh, that's not just to oppress the organizers, that's also the organizers are looking at it from the audience and the point of view of the audience says, well, but why will the audience enjoy this? And in, in Foss Asia's case, because we have anything up to 12 tracks, why will the audience choose to be in this room instead of the other adjacent rooms? That doesn't apply to all conferences, but it applies to, to large conferences. That's some interesting points, and actually we do it a little bit different with PyCon, so that's, I, can, I can show a different perspective on this now. So what you say, uh, describe what you're talking about, obviously is the most important thing. We get a lot of proposals, which is something like, uh, I don't know, because of the emergence of AI, it has shown that this and that is important, and I want to speak about it. And I'm like, yeah, but are you going to use Python? This is a Python conference. <laughs> right? If you don't even tell me what kind of Python software you are going to show us, I can't use you for a Python conference, unless it's some kind of community talk or diversity talk or something like that, right? Lots of people leave it out. They don't tell us what packages are they using. Are they showing any code? You know, so um, this is important, right? So that as a, as a conference organizer, I can in, envision how is this talk going to work? Like, is it even possible to convey this much knowledge in 30 minutes only? Does this speaker maybe over underestimate the time constraint or overestimate his own speaking abilities? So uh, the topic should be relatively small, easy to understand, both for beginners and uh, more advanced audiences. When you have a speaker that is like uh, some, I don't know, rocket scientist um, who maybe is not a very good speaker but hyper intelligent. Maybe the topic is really, really interesting, but 90% of the people in the room will not understand anything that he says and will not enjoy the talk in the end, right? So for a conference, I mean, you go there for eight hours, you listen to one talk, to the next talk, to the next talk, and you will fall asleep, seriously. So you need somehow engaging speakers who are able to break down complex topics into simple terms, right, and demonstrate a little bit to keep people motivated. If you just have slides with hundreds of words on it and lots of facts and mathematical formulas, people will fall asleep. You need to show them something, right? So I like, this is what I like to see. Is there some practical use in the talk somehow? Is there at least a few lines of code, at least a little demo five minutes at the end of the talk or something like that? So the next point, that who you are, of course, for keynote speakers, it's important. The keynote speaker drives traffic to the conference, mm -hmm. drives uh, sponsors and everything. What are the keynote speakers? Oh, mean? so the keynote speakers are usually people that we even pay for flight and accommodation. We fly them in from the US, so they're like celebrities in the community. Uh, which uh, should en encourage people to buy a conference ticket because, wow, I have a chance to talk to this person in, in real life. And I mean, that is also one of the great reasons why you should go to conferences. You can make really good connections and it's really, really inspiring and motivating for your career. Then, because after the conference, you're suddenly friends with Daniel Greenfeld on, on Twitter and you know, when you have a question, he remembers you from the conference and he'll answer your questions when you have some jingle question and so on and it <coughs> propels your career forward, so it's important. It's really good to meet these people. But what I wanted to say is for, for this conference, for PyCon APEC in, in May, um, we are actually doing the proposals anonymous, so we don't know who the person is. But so, but let me, sorry, please let me clarify. Mm -hmm. that's, I didn't quite mean what is your prestigious status? Right, okay, yeah, I, I guess that. What yeah. I mean is, what is your, like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If you're a junior developer who does nothing but, but clear low-level UI bugs on yep. this project, right. and you've been doing that for three years, that's really important information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you yeah. haven't given me anything at all about your connection with the thing you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. now, and if I've got the hour, I'll do the research, <laughs> yeah. but it happens, and frequently it does. That, that was what I mean, I didn't mean, <laughs> Names and yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I, we should clear that up, right? Yeah. So that the who you are part, you should put in prior speaking experiences when you can show that you've spoken at yeah. another conference. The conference organizer, oh, awesome! This is one of the pro potential good ones that we we should invite. Um, if you have never spoken before, but you really want to, you should also mention that I have never spoken, but you know I'm willing to train. Maybe I will go to some meetups before the conference. Maybe you can help me out. You can write this into the CFP. You can say, I have no experience, but I think my talk is really good. Please help me out. I will personally 
uh, give you a slot. I mean, we will have five more months until the conference. I will invite you to be a speaker at one of our Python user group meetups, and then you can train one smaller topic uh, in front of a smaller con uh, audience first, right? Yeah, I so, think this is the thing. Like conference, conference organizers also don't want to see the same lineup of speakers like every year, right? Yeah. So then they kind of like having first-time speakers. Yes, yeah. they might screw up, but yeah. they they also they are also very keen, and then they prepare, and then you you can see them nervous, mm -hmm. and then people down there they know. Okay, so this conference is open to accepting more speakers, and so they will give you some leeway. Yeah. So I guess uh, long story short. Um, Definitely describe exactly what you're going to talk about in the talk, and if you have prior speaking experiences or anything like that, put that into the who you are part. Also, if you are a maintainer of open source repositories or something like that, this is always uh, that something that organizers like to see. What about like links to past conference uh, talk recordings? Is that would you actually be following those links and? Sure, like we would, but then it completely <laughs> defeats the purpose of having an anonymous uh, CFP process. But we would definitely click at it, it of course. It, there's, there's usually as long as you've hit first. Sorry, another to our panelists here. <laughs> as long as you've hit first, the things that a that organizers are definitely going to need in order to make any sense of your proposal at all. There's usually no problem with ancillary information that's relevant. Mm. In some cases, and certainly I think Foss Digital does this, we have a, <coughs> is there anything else you want to tell us? Because the first three things go on the program. Mm. Right, so is, is there anything else you want to tell us? Mm. That's a perfect place for that sort of supplemental information. Mm. Maybe we look at it, maybe we don't. Maybe it's in, you know, uh, in 600 proposals, we look at the supplementary information for 20. And so, okay, 90%, 5 percent doesn't matter. But mm. for those, those line cases, maybe it helps us. So it's, it's okay, it's, particularly if, if you're invited to provide supplementary information, it's certainly within reason to provide it, but you know, help the person receiving your proposal by, by prioritizing those, yes. Cool. So, yeah. mm. Okay. Um, so, first I was crafting the proposal, right? So when crafting the proposal, in my case, um, the topic that I had that I spoke um, throughout the whole of last year was actually a very niche topic, which was actually accessibility. Um, and so basically, in the um, and I actually had a personal story to tell as well, um, because I'm actually essentially blind in one eye. And uh, there was a time a uh, couple of years back when I actually had an injury on the my seeing eye, so I actually became blind for an entire weekend. So. I thought that, hey, you know, I want to get this story out because during the time when I was actually blind, um, you know, trying to use any website or mobile apps at all was just horrendous, right? It was just horrendous. I had voiceover, but it was essentially useless because it was telling me that there's this button here, but what does the button do? What does the button do? It just says button, button, <laughs> button, like button what? <laughs> so, so... So I had a very strong incentive to actually say something and you know tell people why this is important from a very personal perspective. So in the CFP I basically said, you know, um, I'm gonna share a story about what happened to me this one weekend and here are some of the, and what are some of the tips that you can make your web uh, website or mobile app more accessible um, to users who are actually visually impaired. And in the why I should talk about it, um, basically I said, you know, I basically just, you know, gave a little bit of a history of um, some of my involvement. So prior to this talk, I've also been involved actually quite a fair bit over the last few years with um, some blind association. I've given some talks on accessibility and ex um, ac assistive technologies. Um, to the Malaysian Association of the Blind. I've done some meetup talks about accessibility. So I, ju I just put a history of all of these things there. And then I just said that, and um, by the way, I'm also kind of essentially blind in one eye. And this is why getting this topic out is very important to me because even with um, correction, my good eye does not actually have 20-20 vision either. So uh, 10, 20 years down the road, I may actually be <laughs> blind and it's um, it's kind of scary it's kind of a, a bit of a scary prospect so you know just put all of these things all of this information that helps the uh, conference organizer to know why speaking about this topic is so important to you and why it's so important to get this topic out there 
Maybe I'll just add one more sentence. Uh, all the three of them mentioned something about who you are, and Jeannie mentioned a personal story. Whether or not you're doing a conference talk for the first time and you're fearful and you're nervousness, mm -hmm. authenticity and sincerity of what you are talking about will never be missed by the audience. And that's the utmost thing that any audience will appreciate more than the content and the delivery yep. is authenticity and who you are. So stick to yourself, whether you're a beginner or expert, be who you are. Right, that's very good advice. That's very good yeah. advice. And then going back to the what we talked about, just how do we even get out of writing CFP? CFP is great, and then this is what we're doing, right? As another thing is that you know the conferences are looking for sponsors, companies sponsor conferences, and then normally sometimes as part of the sponsorship package, the companies are invited to send some speakers, and then that's their chance to put up your hands, be like. I want to speak at this conference. Uh, well, even then, organizers want probably some idea yeah, yep. mm -hmm. uh, what the speaker is going to talk about. Even, <laughs> even if the sponsor has essentially purchased a, a, a time slot, you still want things like, okay, so there'll be a panel afterwards. Who are they sending? What's their expertise? What's their agenda? As organizers, we need to know that stuff. So it's, it's, you're not entering into a competitive Sorry. process at that point, but certainly organizers still want some idea. Right. Depends on the organizer, of course. <laughs> So no, I think the organizers that I've met in Singapore, we are uh, very careful of speaking to the sponsors and say, making sure that the, the sponsored speaker they send is also relevant. And that has worked out most of the time. Right. I think that conversation is still important, like uh, what yeah. Roland said. Yeah, so chances are you won't yeah. get out of writing CSP, <laughs> even if your company is sponsoring. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. Um, all right, so then um, any more like, just kind of like, how do you break into this conference speaking thing? Because sometimes it might be like intimidating, right? Because these keynote speakers are these celebrities, and then you know the, all these people seem to know what they're talking about, and then first time seems to be always difficult. And you mentioned that meetups are a good place yes. to start. Let engineers at SG record your meetup, and that becomes part of your. Bio. I think it's very important in the day of information, social media, that you are able to create your content, and you can do it so easily. If nobody is willing to publish your technical articles, publish it yourself on your blog. Put that link up. Publish mm -hmm. 10, 20 times. Say that I've written 20 times on my blog. See samples. That's what I did, actually. I approached like Ned Tata and I said, these are 20 articles I wrote it myself. Uh, I'm a first-time writer, but uh, these are 20 articles I've written. For the conference article as well, uh, for the conference speaking as well, these are the 40 episodes I've done on screencasting. Judge me. Here I am. So uh, I think create content for yourself. Put it out there. There's no audience. It's a great practice for you, so do it. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? Well, so, okay. Go ahead. I think if you're um, trying to break into conference speaking and you're first time, you're not sure, uh, maybe, you have a, maybe you feel that your topic is a bit of a beginner topic, which is fine, actually, because I think all conferences, they look for diverse topics. Because mm -hmm. if you've got all, like, you know, expert level topics, I think <laughs> it's going to fly over everybody's head anyway and nobody will come, come back the next year. Uh, one good way actually is to maybe if you're a first time, try to target the lightning talks first. Mm, that's the point. Yeah. Five minutes. Yeah. You know, those starting talks, they are generally five to ten minutes. They are quick, easy to get over with, easy to... Um, and you don't have to think as hard. It's like, oh my god, how am I going to fill up content for 20 <laughs> minutes? Yeah, you know? And once you do one lightning talk you do another and then you realize that hey you know it, it's not that bad and maybe I can try to level up to 20 minutes and the second thing that I want to also bring up is even for those who are so-called expert um, presenters uh, they ask any of them and they will very easily tell you that they get nervous every time as well I was sitting in Red Dot Rubicon last year waiting for my turn to talk and I was actually sitting next to Aaron Patterson, who is actually one of the top Rails committers, and um, he asked me, are you next? I said, yeah. And then after that, he said, are you nervous? Yeah. And I asked him back, what about you? He said, I am so nervous, I'm not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a keynote speaker. So don't feel bad about being nervous because it happens to everybody. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then... Being nervous is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, first it's time quite I, normal. Yeah, I was a, 
first time I was a conference speaker, I was nervous. And then so is that man sitting in the corner. Uh, he was nervous too. And then so we like, I snuck into the bar next to the conference room <laughs> to get a drink <laughs> and met that guy. And he's my husband now. So, <laughs> you know, so being nervous is not that There's bad a of a story. thing. You know, <laughs> 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 is, there, is there a conference romantic story? Uh, <laughs> Cool, cool, so all right. Maybe uh, we yeah. can also add um, to get into the conference speaking yeah. uh, thing. You can volunteer for a conference, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And okay. you can, for example, say, I could be the MC. Like Sayani, oh, that's yes. MC okay. for PyCon many times. <laughs> She's actually the best MC in the world, so. <laughs> um, but you don't have to bring your own talk. You yeah. only have to learn the names of the people, which for me is an impossibility. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you can remember a name, you can read off a paper. So next talk is by so-and-so. He's, uh, I don't know, the head of engineering at Carousel, and he's going to speak about this and that, and give them a round of applause. Boom, done. And then you do this 20, uh, 20 times during the yeah. conference. And suddenly you realize, okay, you know, taking a microphone and standing in front of 500 people is actually possible, right? And then maybe next year you you're no longer the MC, but you will be one of the speakers, right? So you can um, um, put yourself on the stage without really having to give a talk. So that could be one small thing. And of course, like we said many times already, go to the meetups. There are there's meetup every day. Monday to Friday, there's a meetup. Maybe not Friday, but there's a meetup. There's, people go there because there's free pizza, right? Um, uh, and they always need speakers. Always, always. We are super desperate for, for getting speakers. I have to yeah. beg people on my knees on Facebook every month, please give me a talk. I need two speakers, right? And Anything, I need talk and meetups are great. will be yeah. accepted. Five minutes. We, we had a talk about how to install PipEnv, which is a <laughs> software like NPM or RubyGems to install packages. And usually people use pip in Python, and now there's pip uh, something, some other way to do it. Very simple talk, but everybody in the audience was like, oh, awesome, I heard about this, uh, but I haven't had the time to try it out. And it's really, that's mostly the, the case for, for all the tech topics. People mm -hmm. kind of know about it, but they don't have the time to try it. And they think, oh, this will cost me five hours of my life, and maybe it's not worth it. Then you go to the meetup, somebody shows you, you know, 20 minutes. You can, you, you can get this done, and this is how you do it. And then you get inspired, and then you really make this part of your tool chain. So these kind of easy, small topics where you demonstrate a, a nice tool in an approach, in an, in an accessible way, uh, gets you into speaking very, very easily. Yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. briefly yeah. plug, because of the sheer scale of FOSS Asia, we need an unusually <laughs> large number of MCs, or moderators, we call them. Yeah. Uh, if you would like to do that, we are looking for volunteers <laughs> right now <laughs> for FOSS Asia end of March. Come talk to me. And if you're an MC on any conference, you can put it as part of your speaker bio, right? Yeah. yeah. And just be like, I was an MC on this conference. You know, that's, that's, that's like a chance to practice yeah. and something that you can add to your profile. It's like, why isn't everybody doing this? Yeah. Uh, can I add on something? Uh, maybe as an analogy to athletes. Uh, let's say, uh, who's the fastest 100-meter? Uh, uh, Usain Bolt, right? Do you think every day he's just practicing 100 meters? He's not, right? He's sprinting, he's doing weightlifting, he's doing a variety of athletic uh, physical practice. Same for public speaking. If you want to become a conference speaker, don't just train for conference speaking. Mm. Train MC for impromptuness, train for a meetup, train for a lightning speaker, train for moderator, for panels like this. Yeah. Sometimes we need train for different uh, ideas and avenues for public yeah. speaking. And then when you are on your 100 meter race, you will perform. Yeah. And I think um, another uh, way to actually get started um, in a very controlled and, um, environment mm -hmm. uh, to do public speaking actually is to mm -hmm look within your company itself, you know, within your organization and say like, hey, you know, guys, I want to share this topic um, over lunch. Can, uh, I'm going to, um, I want to do a brown bag session. Mm -hmm. So book a room, book a space, um, send the invite to your colleagues, tell them, hey, you know, bring back lunch. I'm going to share about this topic. Mm -hmm. You'll be surprised at the amount of people who would actually sign up to bring back lunch, to listen to you talk over lunch. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. So yeah, I remember back uh, in like my days in Pivotal, we had the brown 
like TikTok Tuesdays,、mm -hmm. and then I brought the same tradition to my previous company,、uh, Quancast, as well. So it's just every Tuesday、yeah. we're gonna have a TikTok,、yeah. and、yeah. you can ask the company to sponsor lunch even or bring、yeah. your own、exactly. lunch. It's、bring、a it's a company. I think I find that's just like companies normally they encourage such like little gathering because they want employees to share what they learn, what they want to learn, and then even if it's a topic that you have no idea about, this、yeah. is Tim's favorite. It's like even if you don't know about this topic. Don't worry about it. Sign up for it. Just give a talk to you、yeah. a month from now. <laughs> yes, that's force what forces you to learn <laughs> about that topic. And, and then, then yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So and then and then you're just presenting in front of your colleagues, right? They already know. They already saw, saw your shitty code and your commitment. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's like what's there to hide? You know,、yeah. this is、yeah. all I've learned, and they criticize me. So、yeah. and then. I, I think that that is a healthy environment to create、yeah. in your company as well. And then I think it's another thing. Sign up to organize like a tech talk Tuesdays or yeah. Yeah. just run back because really when you're the organizer, you can choose to give a talk or not. And then、mm. most important thing, you get to hassle people and then <laughs> go and ask them to give a talk. Or you know, worst case, if you just have like a bunch of conference talk recordings that you want to watch and you have you, you can't find、yes. time, you can always pick the the recordings and play it if nobody is、yeah. speaking、yeah. at the tech talk. That's it. Thank yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Like that. That was a that was a good point. Yeah. Cool.、Um, any questions from the audience so far? Yes. Pitching your talk comes down to on the day you find out that your audience are complete beginners, and then you pitch a talk that's really technical. And I was wondering if you had any experiences. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Last year at Foss Asia, I had. In terms of being an organizer, I do submit talks through the same process that everybody else does, with the same form that everybody else does. And so I submitted one on performing phase-preserving Doppler shift correction when receiving satellite downlink. Communication using the FPGA built into the Novena. <laughs> that was the act, that can, was almost. Can anybody repeat what he did? <laughs> I know some、anybody. of those. Anybody? Did, did anyone understand more than half of those words? <laughs> <laughs> this was very much、But、pitched. I know downlink. At the rate, <laughs> this was pitched at the hardware track, where there are people at least for whom RF and FPGAs and all that stuff are part of their lingo. But because of a reasonably high, high profile speaker,、um, shortly before and not long before, it might have been a week before,、uh, Mario. Uh, one of the principles of、okay. the, the sort of, sure. of the Fossage organization comes to me and says, "We want to put you on the keynote track." <laughs> <laughs> like, are you kidding? <laughs> Half the words in the title won't make sense to most people, let alone the content of the talk. And so, yes, it was necessary to very quickly, it, and it might not even be two weeks. I recall having to do this in an enormous hurry、uh, to re-gear the talk so that, fortunately, it was also halved in length. So that was actually it helped to simply discard most of the the heavy duty tech stuff and describe in broad terms what the pieces were, why the project was interesting, and, and what the point was. And so, I, for that one, fortunately, I had at least some days' notice. It wasn't a an on the day thing, but it's as a general rule, if you've got a a talk prepared,、um, there are times when it's necessary to, for reasons of complexity or even just time. To just skip bits, so yeah, that's too hard. And if you end up finishing a few minutes early, take more questions. I, mean, I, I think it'll be also quite helpful if you plan or intend to speak at a particular conference and you、um, don't know how the audience is going to be like. It would be good if you can at least attend that conference as a an attendee at least once first, so you have an idea on the kind of audience that that conference is targeting. Uh, unless is unless you're actually going to speak at particular、uh, meetup groups or niche conferences where there is a very specific kind of audience being targeted, then you can actually gear your talk towards it. Yeah, but otherwise, you know, just at least attend once as a attendee first. I think what you brought about the topic of audience is one of the most important things. I I don't think we address it enough. So thank you for bringing it up.、Uh, I have actually emailed organizers before to ask about the audience, like what sort of organize.、Mm. Because if it's an international conference, I will not be able to、yeah. attend it, unlike local ones. You know,、yeah. I 
will never have a chance to attend it. Keynote speakers, yeah, probably you have to like make it a bit more broader. But talk to the organizer and tell like what I've done this for, especially for workshops. Like I go there, I'm like, are they technical or non-technical? How many of them are there? Is there a QA and a session? And this is where I say uh, impromptu public speaking skills are also important, like gauge it. And sometimes I do ask live audience questions. So how many of you are here know about this? And that's uh, okay. So that's why I say impromptu, do your research about the audience. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, yeah um, one thing you could definitely do is in your proposal, write down this is advanced yeah. and um, I think you should write down what ask. are the prerequisites some will ask, yeah. you should in the proposal you should tell the organizers these are the prerequisites if someone uh, because they will put this uh, talk abstract on their website mm -hmm. and yeah. the whole audience will know in advance what they are getting into mm -hmm. and if the abstract already says advanced topic uh, you need to know this and this and this and this and this uh, otherwise you will be lost and if there's still a beginner in your audience, it's his own fault, right? It's not, it's not your problem. But, um, and then you can design the slides in such a way where you talk about very advanced topics and you can give links to how, where can you learn more about this in case you are not that advanced yet and you accidentally ended up in my talk, you know? So, but I think uh, most of the talks will be recorded. So if you speak to a seemingly advanced audience, but the audience is in fact not advanced, the real advanced audience will eventually find your talk on YouTube. So you will eventually reach your uh, desired audience anyways, right? So don't worry about mm. pissing off uh, 50 people in a room on that day. Be but I mean, if you put it into your proposal, this is an advanced topic, hopefully you will have the right people in the audience, right? So this is how I would do it. I would just make it very clear and tell people this is what you're getting into. Yeah, I guess that would work very well for like multi-track conferences where yeah. people get to pick, oh, I'm going to yeah. do this track or that track. It will help your audience as well. That's a good point. Yes? Can you uh, like plan your talk if it is advanced? Can you actually um, use that a bit and include some introductory stuff so that um, when you actually go to that uh, conference on that day and you see that there are, there are enough audience who are at different levels of experience, you can actually uh, we prepared for actually, and some of the talks that I've seen from really wonderful speakers and language creators, every time they come out, they actually say some of the simple things, of basic fundamental stuff, uh, to get everybody you know, on the same page. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. So that that can come out of how you structure your talk. So I habitually avoid using text on my slides. My slides are mostly photographs, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. screenshots yeah. sometimes. Mm -hmm. And okay, if I'm short of ideas or time, maybe a couple of bullet points. Usually I'm presenting from sort of high level down to detail anyway. And mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of room, yeah. not so much in the, in the preparation of the talk, but just the way I happen to structure my talks means if I realize I'm in a room where um, it isn't what I thought it was, I'm then able to spend more time with the introductory material and go a bit light on the more detailed slides. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you, certainly if you're structuring that way, sort of uh, overview to more detail, then depending on your audience, you spend more time at the front or back of that, that process. Sure. Usually for me, what I do is, um, like Roland, I actually keep my slides very um, high level, broad. I don't go in too much details. And because I actually write um, in the presenter notes what I'm actually going to say and deliver, so most of the time, unless you're a keynote speaker, you're very likely not going to be the first person at the first hour delivering the talk. So you actually have time during the conference itself to actually <coughs> observe the audience, observe the questions and answers, observe other conference speakers. And you by midday, you will have a pretty fairly good idea on how the um, audience is like. And you can actually edit how you're going to deliver what you're going to say on the fly. So actually... Having that presented also so does have additional benefits. Yeah. Well, I would say that's pretty advanced. I will not dare to touch <laughs> my prepared topic <laughs> during the con. I mean, I did that once. I came unprepared, and I basically had to pre uh, do the last five slides of my talk <laughs> during the conference. It's I really <laughs> stressful. You don't. Want to do it. <laughs> So I, don't what not like <laughs> I only change yeah. what I'm going to say. I think this is where I say it's yeah. individual preference. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you will find your own style if you do it 20 yeah. times, and that's yeah, why yeah. practice yeah. is enough. Yeah. No matter what we say. What you suggested 
start with giving the basics first and then make it more and more complicated mm. during the talk is okay. Then you lose the audience at the end of the talk, right? <laughs> so that's that's fine. Um, I mean, I've been, I know nothing about machine learning and big data and these kind of things, but everybody talks about it during my meetups and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, okay, I heard these vocabularies in the last few meetups before and you still get something out of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you feel like, okay, the first three slides, I got that because I've seen that before, I learned a little bit, but now I'm lost. Okay, so, so be it, right? Um, but if you have a nice progression, so people will understand, okay, I have to learn this first, then I have to understand this, mm -hmm. and oh, here I got lost. So this is what I need to look into next. I can go and Google for it after the meetup, after the talk, right? Yeah. So yeah, don't put the most complicated slide first, obviously, right? Make it a slow progression, so you still have the advanced stuff that you want to convey at, in, your, in your talk, but you also don't lose the audience right at the beginning. And then I think there's no need to observe the audience and things like that. You stick to the, your own thing, you just make sure that it's delivered in a good way. Um, you know what you're talking about. You know, um, then then the the content doesn't really matter that much. If the if the presentation is nice and people can follow your train of thought, then it's fine. Then they can go back to the talk, to the recording later, mm -hmm. and and you know stop at that slide, Google around. Ah, now I understand it. Go to the next slide, and then if it's if they really want to learn what you said and they didn't understand it, they will figure it out. Mm. Yep. One related thought. Um, and sort of along the lines of what I've described, it's always, I think it's always, well, it is always easier to drop prepared material than it is to make up new material mm. live. Yeah. It's possible, but it's hard. Yeah, oh, and so yeah. my yeah. general approach is to have sort of prepared too much stuff and then yep. to just, keep, this is a skill because you've got to keep your eye on the time, <laughs> but to drop stuff adaptively mm. um, as I go through it. And a number of my talks in the last couple of years in Singapore, I can recall having done that exact thing, where I've just covered the thing in not quite the right planned and I'm short of time, so I just skip three, four slides. Uh, the other related idea is sometimes you've prepared um, specialized things that might or might not be of interest, mm. or that you might anticipate coming up during questions, and those you just put after the last slide, oh, yes. and don't, don't slow the, show them unless the question comes up. So it's, yeah, generally, the other way to be adaptable is to make sure you're prepared too much and you can drop stuff rather than yeah. be shorthanded and like, well, okay, <laughs> twiddle. Um, actually, hang on. I, I have one more thing to add. I actually have a short story to tell regarding the audience. Uh, there's this conference, it's not Git Camp. It was a conference, it's like an unconference thing where... Bar Camp. You know, bar Camp, yes. So like, I thought bar camp was a great idea oh, because yeah. then you go in there and then there's no agenda prepared. You mm -hmm. propose talks and then just write it on a small card and then if enough people vote for it, then that, that talk gets Great delivered. for impromptu speaking skill. Exactly, but what I didn't know was that <laughs> that talk was not a tech audience. So oh. I went to, that, went to the conference, I wrote down my talk, was character encoding, put my name down there. People actually voted for it. And I ended up giving that talk. I was like, great, I'm gonna talk about character <laughs> encoding. And then people were like, and then halfway through, someone was like, um, I thought you were gonna talk about like writing a fiction. How do you encode <laughs> <laughs> Characters. Characters. <laughs> and I was, then that, that's the moment I clicked. I'm like, shit, my audience is not a tech-focused audience. <laughs> so like, you know, halfway I had to like switch gear. And then I'm like, okay, so I pretty much dropped all the technical things. And then just focus on like UTF-8. Repeat that word as many times as possible. <laughs> yeah. So if there's one thing that this audience yeah. is gonna take out, from my talk is UTFA. <laughs> yep. They're gonna know what <laughs> UTFA is the thing that you should use whenever there's an option, which I think was good for the society. That's, that's, that's a pretty extreme. <laughs> well done. So <laughs> the point is, there are times you might miss, you know, evaluate or yeah. access your uh, audience. Don't panic. Just kind of like uh, this. That's where I remember this uh, this uh, advice from my professor. Some some of my, uh, some of you might know him. It's Ben Leon. He's from uh, NUS School of Computing. And then because I, I asked him for advice when I was invited to be a lecturer in SMU because you know it's different when you deliver a two hour lecture versus a uh, 20 minutes talk, right? I was like, how am I even going to pull this off? He's like, remember you wanna have one thing that your audience wanna take away. Mm. One thing, yeah. don't be greedy. And then so I think that's, that comes down to if you have a very complicated topic, maybe boil it down to one thing. Um, that might help you prepare mm -hmm. as well. 
Yes. yes, plenty of questions. I do that. Uh, and I, I do that. And the things that you can observe. Yeah, right yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. that you're more or less engaged at, at that spot at that time. Yeah. Like, you know, how many people in the audience in the room. And then lastly is that maybe through the course of your talks, you know, because uh, I, I realized this when I was in university, sometimes some lecturers, uh, what they would do is that in some midst of their lectures or something, they will inject some fun or some, some funny yep. slides to just get you back on course. <coughs> and maybe through giving talks, is it a good idea to throw a question to the audience, to, you know, audience engaging, rather than just text and probably the wonder all. I have something to add because I've gone through Toastmasters and one thing I would say, if you have a chance, join Toastmasters, like one, two, three, a program. They say that if you are a beginner, uh, this is pretty advanced, uh, technique actually throwing audience questions because you are already nervous and you're trying to throw <laughs> audience questions or the other thing that you said what's the other thing you said uh, inject, humor. inject humor is okay. one of the hardest public speaking ever do you agree with me you crack a joke and nobody laughs at you <laughs> seriously in Toastmasters like I wanted to do that humor track and that's like after like two big so I would say leave humor uh, after your like 20 talks like <laughs> practice the beginner stuff first yeah so join Toastmasters <laughs> and I have the reverse view on throwing questions uh, yes. okay. this guy this guy has hand <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just a shout out it's a small room everybody can hear everybody um, so if you're in a position where uh, you have given your meetup talk um, and you have got your initial uh, you know uh, slides out there in the community and uh, your maybe in a position to give a talk at the conference, say if your proposal is accepted, and uh, you just have like 40 days or so prepared, and you've got even to balance that as a first time speaker, in addition to the fact that you've got your own work deadlines and deliverables. Have you been in that kind of a crunch situation, if I may put it that way? Repeat talks. Oh, it's my whole life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Yeah, so how about you know, balancing both, have you found ways to prepare better? Uh, so, maybe I'll take Yes, go yeah. ahead. So, uh, although my first um, speaking experience was actually in 2008 at FOSS and MOI, um, but in between 2008 and last year, there was a, almost a 10 year gap, and essentially, when I got back to the speaking circuit last year, it was kind of like start from scratch, now, you know? 10 years you forget everything already. So, uh, what I did was I actually, after I submitted the proposal and then I got accepted and then I went, oh shit. <laughs> and I actually told my manager, I said, hey, you know, I signed, I submitted this proposal, I got accepted and I've got um, this amount of days to prepare and um, I might have to take some time out during work, maybe a half an hour, an hour a day to just like prepare and in the days preceding to the uh, conference itself, I would like to request um, and take leave for a couple of days and you know, my manager said, don't take leave, just stay at home, practice the entire day, this is on company time and I'll help you to prepare, I'll help you practice. So sometimes, you know, just going up to your manager and saying that, hey, you know, I I got accepted to, to speak at this conference and you'll be surprised, they'll be very, very supportive. Yeah. Yeah, companies love that. that yeah, it's free publicity are. for them. Yes, yeah. I would say the same. So when you want to achieve work-life balance... Um, <laughs> Do life at work. I should, <laughs> I should use that word because I don't have any. But um, <laughs> um, So teaching stuff is the only way to achieve mastery, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And giving a talk is basically teaching, teaching. right? Yeah. Um, um, so your employer actually has a, an interest in yeah. you teaching stuff at conferences and meetups, yeah. right? Once you've prepared these slides, you know all these things, these imports and whatever by heart, and you will speed up as a developer, right? Yeah. I know the entire Django documentation by heart. 
when I want to import uh, the user model, I know from uh, Django, Contrib, or models import user. I know this by heart. <laughs> and when I started out, I had to look it up every single time. Google import user model. That that you lose 10, 10 seconds uh, to schooling for that, yeah. right? Um, and of course, you are a little bit scared about the questions that you will get. So you dive, you dive deeper for the very first time. You try to look under the hood of certain mm -hmm. things, uh, just so that you are prepared. You don't even talk about them, just so, just in case. So. Um, if your employer does not give you some time um, to prepare the slides and also to train the talk, you should probably consider changing jobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, seriously. I yeah, mean, right. um, it's in their but, best interest. But yeah. yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of time, right? Uh, usually I estimate I want to speak one minute per slide so I can make 30 slides for a 30 minute talk. Mm -hmm. And that's already very risky. Then you have to train perfectly. You cannot even forget one sentence, and then you will overshoot the time, right? And making a slide probably takes you between 10 to 20 minutes. So a 30 minute talk will take definitely six hours uh, only to make the slides, plus yeah. uh, at least one hour, two times 30 minutes to train it, right? I really sit down at home and I speak to the wall. Mm -hmm. I speak it out loud. And this is the best preparation, in my opinion. Um, so you have to estimate for a 30 minute talk, 10 hours of preparation, right? So, but you know, the conference is in May, the PyCon conference. If you submit your talk today and you get accepted, you have five months, I mean, 10 hours in five months, you will find some time to prepare it, right? Yeah. Just don't, and maybe procrastination, don't procrastinate, <laughs> right? When you get accepted, do the whole thing right away. Submit the slides to the conference speakers, ask for the feedback, and then boom, you're done, right? And then before the conference, the week before, train the talk two times, and then go to the conference and have fun. Yeah, it's very ideal. I, I really wish that's true. <laughs> and normally five months preparation, four months you're like writing about it, and then one month you're actually doing <laughs> it. It's still one month. It's always hey. procrastination. <laughs> 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 it's my husband who can pull yeah, that off. Yes. So not not advice. No, no, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't I know do. who you're okay, talking about. I did a, did a, a talk a couple years ago at the Heritage Festival on, on Amateur Radio, and it was a 60-minute talk. Whoa. It ran 60 minutes and 40 seconds. Um, wow. I was still, <laughs> I was still <laughs> editing slides, not even an hour before starting. I just I had, had messed up and, and had underestimated, actually, the time. Because, yes, I'm accustomed to the 20-minute thing. And to do a, yeah. not two hours, but certainly to, to go to one hour, just <laughs> blew my estimates completely and just... I had been up most of the night doing stuff, and it was still an hour prior putting yeah. the last slides. This is what not to do. Yeah, don't do this. <laughs> what not to do. do don't, 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 don't do this. If you haven't prepared, don't panic. That, that's, that's, I think the, the, the worst thing is, you know, if, if you haven't prepared, just accept what, you know, this is my fate. <laughs> I'm going to help to figure out how to, how to do this, um, you know, on the fly. But ideally, yeah, definitely prepare. <laughs> Yeah. Well, okay. there's also there's different parts of preparation because my in that example I was uh, in essence telling about ten or twelve specific stories in a sequence that sort of constructed a larger um, history and, and argument. So I had been going over those stories, sitting in the train, in the shower, in bed uh, for weeks prior. So I had my material down cold, which meant that I could walk up with a barely coherent set of slides and hold to it, halfway through it, realize it's out of time, skip a chunk, and, and nonetheless finish 40 seconds over time. So it's, there's different bits to preparation, and it's more uh, understand what you're trying to do, what pieces matter for you. If you're telling stories and the, and the, the you know, set up, action, outcome, sequence is the bit that matters, then those are things you can be rehearsing in a whole lot of slack time uh, for weeks or months prior. And then the, the, the actual preparation of, of collateral, like slides, yeah, okay, don't do it the night before. But <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's, may not, it is not the most important part of your talk. I guess the main thing is don't procrastinate. Try to start early. You can just start, you know, putting the main topics, the main headlines on those slides. That's like 10 words. You can sit down for 10 minutes, come up with those 10 words. The next week, okay, let's take the first chapter put down the more detailed slides, right? And then you realize, oh, that's actually a code example that I want to show that doesn't really work or I don't fully understand it. And then you do some research and 
if you try to build a slide, you're like, okay, slides will take 10 hours. Uh, the conference is next week. I have 10 hours maybe on Wednesday because there's a public holiday. Oh my God, don't do that. There's <laughs> always this one yeah, thing you didn't anticipate and then it will blow out your time estimation. And then you have work the next day and you still have only half of the slides and then, it's the, there's the, then the crunch time problems uh, appears. Yeah. Yeah, and then I have, um, I had the pleasure of emceeing uh, JSConf Asia, and I would like to say, like, there was this great talk by Hui Jing. I was like, how did she do that? <laughs> like, I was literally sitting sitting there, it's like, she just spoke without um, um, or anything, and she spoke so fluently, it came to her so naturally. She was like a TED speaker, I was like, how did you do that as she was walking off the stage? How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you. Um, I, I, I mean, I've been listening to everyone share their experience and I agree with Sayani, it's really very different for everybody and I, I'm just going to share the way I do it and I, I don't know if this works for everybody mm -hmm. but um, at the back of my head, I, I have this very strong opinion and again, not everybody is going to agree with this is that Personally, as in, I consider myself a minority speaker because on an international stage, how many speakers have you seen come from Southeast Asia? How many female speakers have you seen come from Southeast Asia? So to me, this is a personal thing. I feel that as a minority speaker, we do not have the benefit of doubt. So it is actually very important to me that I present my best self on an international stage. Those of you who know me personally know that I am a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> I am not serious. I don't take anything seriously. But there's one thing I do take seriously in that. I feel that if I screw up, if I do not prepare, if I slip up, I'm not only ruining it for myself, I'm ruining it for everybody that people associate with. Oh, that Southeast Asian <laughs> woman. <laughs> That just doesn't know how to speak English properly. Um, but I feel that, so in terms of preparation, um, I, I can honestly say that I, I don't really get nervous anymore. First of all, because I have faith in my preparation. So I think this also comes from uh, as an athlete background. Like by the time you go and play in your championship game, you have already done the exact same thing a thousand times. And to, to me, speaking is ranks less uh, is less stressful than than playing in a you know championship game. Honestly, but, but this again, this is my unique experience. So there's that level of, 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 of I would say preparedness there that helps. But I honestly, before I step onto stage, I would have given that talk out loud at least forty times before. At least, and, and I do the same as what Ginny do, uh, does, I write, because uh, for conference, it's a very different from meetup. Conferences, they like, they would, there are other people in, ahead of you and behind you. Mm. Yeah, it's, I feel it's a responsibility and a courtesy to the organizers to keep mm. to the time. Yes. And I have the potential to ramble on, so I know I will exceed <laughs> the time. So I do write every single word out and time it to that. I will get it down plus minus 30 seconds. Yes. Exactly. And, and you did that at, at JSCon uh, yes. Asia. It was like spot on, like <laughs> to the second uh, <laughs> at that time. Yeah. No life coding? Not this time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think what that, how I did it was that um, I do a lot of writing. You mentioned that before. And I'm, I'm one of those people who writes almost as close as I possibly can to speaking. So to me, an article and a talk, there's almost no, no difference like when I do that. And I think that helps. Um, so if you write a lot, uh, I think writing a talk comes a bit easier. A lot of times I turn my talks, uh, articles into talks. Uh, Chris, who is my co-organizer of Talk CS, he does it the other way around. He turns his talks into articles. So again, it's, it's, it's personal preference. So. Again, it's just a lot of practice, and um, find your own style. And don't I, and I think there's also a, a, a level of a, a lack of sh I, w I always call it shamelessness. I'm pretty much shameless, so <laughs> I don't really worry about what other people think of me. Because I I have this. This might sound quite asshole, quite asshole-ish coming out of my mouth, but 
what other people think about me is their problem and not mine. Mm. Woo! So go so for it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm like I'm 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 a fan of myself, so like, it's okay if you're not a fan of me, but you know, I, I I I like me, so I'm gonna talk about what I like, and uh, so so I, I guess. The nervous, the, I guess everybody is self-conscious at the end of the day because we are. It's very human to worry about what other people think of you. But I, I, I think it's important that you have a bit more faith in yourself than because if you don't have, if you don't believe in yourself, nobody's gonna believe in you. Honestly, it's, 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 it's that's just how it is. Uh, audiences can feel it. Audiences can feel. If you are, if you are doubting yourself, so at the end of the day, I feel that believe in your own preparation. Like, of course, you have to prepare first. You cannot like, no prepare and then believe in your own preparation. <laughs> <laughs> but but if you have, right. I, I, like, but if you have, right, just have have a bit more faith in in the effort you put in. Um, and and just let it go. At the end of the day, nobody's going. And then nobody's going to die if you if you bomb. Honestly, what's the worst that can happen, right? It's like, oh, okay. Um, Probably having a bad day. Most people are more forgiving than you expect. Yes. I feel. Yes. Yeah, and the audience are like on your side. They wanna, they wanna, yeah, they're they there want there because they, they wanna want hear what you wanna say. Yes. Yeah, so that that helps. But yeah. uh, so long story short, put in the effort to prepare. It yeah. matters. Uh, would you add on to what um, Hu Jin said about you know, writing exactly <coughs> all the words that you're actually going to say during it's the talk? Yeah, it's yeah, not, not it's not everybody, everybody but. Um, I actually take it one step further. I actually put in, I actually put where I'm actually supposed to pause as well, because sometimes when I'm nervous, I just I have a tendency to talk too fast, without any pauses. So I would actually in my presenter slides for those who have actually seen any of my uh, mm. presenter slides, sorry presenter notes, you actually see the exact text that I'm going to say, and then in bold and in red color pause. <laughs> and then the next sentence, and then in bold and red, pause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it helps actually. Yeah. It helps to remind you to you know, pause, take a breath, and continue. Good. Any more questions before we break? Yes. Are you going to cover a little bit about the style of the slides? Mm -hmm. Are you going to cover that? I guess we covered a little bit, like... Um, we can talk about that. Um, yeah? I... No, I detest... The main, the main thing, <laughs> especially in the tech conferences, uh, and uh, every tech conference, there will be someone who will put, uh, I don't know, uh, code on the slides uh, with font uh, size 6, and uh, <laughs> maybe grey or black background. And so, so maybe, his favorite, maybe his favorite color theme, which is totally not rendering on the on the projector. I, yeah. I use uh, images wherever possible, and that's one of the reasons. It's not the only reason, but it's one of them. Is then I don't have to worry about that. Choose the image, frame it sensibly, and then whatever the presentation technology is, the the rough edges will get will get dealt with. If I'm if I'm using text. Um, it's I mean I can't quite get down to seven plus minus two words, but um, keep the amount of text on any given slide as small as humanly possible, and then make it. And PowerPoint, for as many faults, actually does this correctly. Is it will enlarge the text to to fill the space depending upon how many words you put in. So don't keep adding words until it gets down to being six points. Mm. Well, some people in in, in, tech, in tech talks, uh, some people will switch to Twitter and show code. That's for me a pet peeve. As, a, as an audience member, I detest seeing people live coding, live demonstrating, <laughs> dicking about with debuggers that don't work, arming arming while the. I've done that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I bet, like, we've all done it. Um, See I've, different styles. I've, I've stopped doing it because having looked at it as an audience member, I find that incredibly frustrating. But if you ha absolutely have to do that, I think most modern code editors do actually have either a presenter mode or a presenter team. And if you don't have a presenter team or a presenter mode, create one. Okay, so I, I have a few suggestions. Uh, you can never go wrong with high contrast. Like, you know, when I saw Wei put that yellow, the projector just need to tweak its color or something. I, I know it's a theme, uh, and the yellow and the white might just appear the same. Yeah. Never, you cannot go wrong with high contrast. Uh, there is a text editor theme, I think it's 
one night or something like that that is very presenter friendly just google about it i think white background with uh, uh code is better than black background with code it's just because of the white contrast thing uh, the contrast thing um as big as font as possible you can never go wrong with that of course images yeah. um adding on to that i have always done live coding <laughs> So uh, the framework that I use, once again, it's my personal style, is reveal.js, all right? Uh, and I hate uh, switching to text editors because when I do that, you know, uh, let's say your screen one and screen two, I remember way in one of the uh, talks is like she went to other screen and then she had to like go to the display preference and then change to mirror and blah, blah, blah. So I hate changing that. So what I do, because I do reveal.js, it is a web browser based slides. I can actually embed my uh, JavaScript based, even front end stuff there. And it becomes very interactive. Um, when I show hardware, what I've done, thanks to WebRTC, which is a browser, um, uh, browser API, I actually can put the camera view on the reveal.js thing. So I've, I have done a lot of things and using .shell.js or something, I've even displayed my terminal on reveal.js because I do not want to switch to my terminal or my text editor. It is a lot of uh, preparation. Uh, yeah, because I'm very particular about all this. Uh, so it can be done, but once again, it all depends on what you're presenting. I'm a, yeah, because I have hardware to show and then I have like JavaScript interaction and I'm like, yeah, I've done all those kind of <laughs> hacks, yeah. Um, in terms of live coding, um, is it okay to, uh, let's say to avoid the risk, to pre-record the, the demos? Yes. And yeah. then just talk, okay. talk. <laughs> please do that. <laughs> and, and then, please do it that way. Then talk it over while it's playing in the in the video. But you're not actually live coding it. Yes. You're still doing yeah. that thing, but you're already uh, then just explain yeah. it. Yes. Actually, actually, what I've done is like for every on one of my live hardware demos because I need audience interaction. Uh, I actually prepare a recording in case it fails. I show the recording. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. 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 So you don't have to do what's wise. Absolutely. A related piece I would suggest, and particularly for videos, never ever depend upon what the internet. Oh, ever. yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Don't do it oh, yeah. ever. It doesn't yeah. matter what yeah. anyone else tells you. Yeah. yeah. Don't. Your conference computer's going to have a problem. Your network card is going to have a problem. The conference internet is going to have a, blind, a dead spot at the speaker's location. The conference internet is going to be. Uh, jammed by other users using the thing. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to trip over a cable. The sites you need are going to be down. DNS is not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's the internet. The failure modes are numerous, yeah. and they are yeah. almost all Very more good. likely to happen in a conference environment because everything is is a custom build. It's not your desk environment. I have actually brought a 3G cellular router myself that I connect to to show my demo before. But once again, it's a oh, lot so, of work. So yeah, I, yeah, break, bre breaking my own rule, I had a... a, a, a internet, a, internet, internet yeah. well, I had, speak, I had speakers in Boston and, and uh, <laughs> somewhere in Sweden <laughs> with an audience in Singapore. Yeah. The, we had, this is in the Time Center, we had a power failure. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, oh, okay, that won't work then. <laughs> Two minutes <laughs> prior to the start of the session, not in the room where everyone was sitting, but in an adjacent building where our network connection was. <laughs> so, what? <laughs> so yeah. Murphy's out, Law. <laughs> out comes the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Stick it down the laptop and reconnect so that I can put in front of the audience the, yeah. the, the two, and the, the feature speakers was in Boston. And so, uh, yeah, have, if, if the situation absolutely demands it, then have backups and yeah. ideally have enough broadband capability in your phone to do it because that's the, the, usually the one that you use every day. It's not a special thing. It's available to you. You know how to do it. It'll work the first time. But wherever possible, yeah, uh, try not to. Yeah, please switch, avoid. Switch off your wireless and practice your talk, yeah, make yeah, sure it works. Yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, I just, um, so first of all, thank you very much, guys. It's uh, a lot of really, really good, good experience and good information. Um, I just wanted to touch a bit on the topic of topic selection, right? How you, uh, my, 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 I've spoken at a couple of conferences, and I always have a really hard time just figuring out how to balance, you know, all the things I could talk about, with you know, kind of imposter syndrome. What am I qualified to talk? What do I have a right to talk about? Right? 
and and drilling down on. And I'm sure there's stuff in there. There's a tons of topics in there, but I always have a really hard time sort of getting to that point. Right? How do you approach that problem? I always talk about something that blew my mind just recently. Something that I use myself. And I, I discovered that, I spent hours of time figuring it out and setting it up and configuring it. And then I'm like, oh wow, now it works and it does something good for me and I want to share it with the world. So basically, uh, my, the talk that I gave, the first talk at PyCon APEC six, eight, seven years ago was about Vim as a Python IDE. Yeah? I, th I was like, I'm, I'm super late to the party, you know? I was using Windows first and never heard about uh, the terminal. And then uh, Vim, and I was like, hundreds of millions of users are already using it as their main editor, and I'm just a small fish in the ocean who's gonna care about my talk. But I realized that my Vim config was relatively complex and I added lots of cool shortcuts and whatever to make it feel more like a normal editor. So, and that made me onboard the Vim world. <laughs> and, and I was like, hmm, actually now the way I configured it, there's no excuse not to use it. It's just as good as any other editor that I was using before and even better. So I, I want to share that with the world. And I just did this myself. So and then I turned that into a talk. Yeah. And when I give talks at meetups, it's always something I just did at work. Uh, some new way how we you know, build our Django stack for our websites in production, like uh, we recently discovered GraphQL instead of REST APIs, so I talk about that. So bleeding edge new stuff, then nobody can ask you the difficult questions because it's so new that nobody knows about it. <laughs> or you can say it's so new, I still don't know myself, right? So you, can, uh, you don't have to worry about the questions as well when it's super new stuff. Um, yeah, so this is how I approach it. I, I talk about things that I'm very passionate about in, at that time. Yeah. I think there are different styles, uh, like you said. You can either talk about something that blew your mind or something you tried for the past six months. I have done that before in my talks, but the approach I am going to take in the future from now on, once again, I'm a beginner in that area, is a project that I've built for the past six months or one year. And then I want to share that project, or let's say an open source project that got really popular or some people are using. So there are different styles. I don't think there's any wrong or uh, right way. I would say look at the conference, the type of people who go there. And uh, sometimes I also give talks, I think one of you mentioned, is um, I want feedback from the audience. So I give a talk in such a way that I, I have something to learn from the audience as much as I share as well. So if you want feedback, talks are also great. Is it difficult with your shorter topics or you have too many topics? <laughs> <laughs> I have too this, many topics. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah. So, that's yeah. so I have too many th things. It's more about, so for example, I did a, a talk um, at the Hong Kong Big Data Conference as well. It was like five or six years ago. And I didn't know. And I sort of got invited to this conference by accident. Mm -hmm. I was asked to do it. I was like, I don't know anything about Big Data, but you know what? I'm just going to take it. Right? And I essentially did a giant research project and put together a talk, right? And it was, I don't think anybody was particularly interested in it. And I actually literally kind of uh, had all of the, you know, the text sort of written out and everything and kind of just went through it. Uh, but um, uh, then, you know, a couple years later, I did a couple of talks. Uh, and, and to be honest, I felt really awkward doing it because I just felt like I had no business being there, but whatever. Uh, but then I did a couple of talks later at um, some IAB conferences. So basically, I'm a digital, digital media so like kind of business. Yeah, so like, uh, and I was, did some ad tech, ad tech related talks. And those, like, I had a completely different experience. Because first of all, I was really, really in touch with the material, and I had a story to tell, right? And so it was really, like, the arc of the talk was very much a progression in the story, and I felt much more comfortable. About that. But again, that, that topic that I picked was, it was a bit scoped by where the talk was fitting in, right? So it was, a, it was actually um, intended to be a series of training seminars, right? And so it was like, the topic was ad tech. I kind of was able to sort of drill down a bit. So, but now, um, you know, I've been, part of the reason I came today is because I haven't really done any talks in a while, and, and I've been working, I've been working in a company for the last four years that essentially has gone from an eight-person company to uh, almost a hundred-person company, and I've been really, really, we've done so much stuff, we've built so much tech, we've built, it's like a dead organization, there's so much learning there, right, and so much interesting stuff that I think I could talk about, but I just, I'm having a really hard time just sort of like figuring out, okay, where do I start? And we're talking about I just want to talk about everything. I think you've, right? you've already answered part of it. If you, if your presentation style, you've already answered part of it. If your presentation style is narrative, if that's if if, make, if working with a consistent story arc is in fact how you present, now that's I don't know if the majority, but a very large fraction of people present that way, then 
you start with your list of 20, I have this problem right now for Force Asia, and so you start with a list of 20 things that, that you might talk about. It's like, okay, which of these can I tell a coherent, interesting, relevant, compelling, recent story about? Okay, now there are three left. Yeah. Right, and then, okay, futz about a bit and just pick one around. But if there's, as a, as a, can you talk about stuff? Is it stuff you're interested in? Is there a coherent story arc? Is it current? Is it, I mean, there's those sorts of questions. Just write a CFP for each of them. I mean, <laughs> throw at the conference organizer, see if we find sticks. Yeah. Still, think, <laughs> still takes time to write. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I mean like, it sounds like you are easy. actually in a perfect situation. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm in a similar situation yeah. in a startup, and we build new stuff all the time, bleeding edge stuff, and so on. And uh, and then the, the imposter syndrome comes in, right? Yeah, right? You're like, okay, of all these cool things, I learned this myself, but is it actually uh, so important? Maybe I was an idiot, and everybody else already knows about it, right? But I think uh, if you had to learn it yourself, there are probably one million other people on yeah. the planet who also would benefit from your journey, of how you yeah. learn that. So just do it. Yeah, I don't mean, worry about you, it. You said something earlier, Martin. Actually, that, that so I get chased all the time to do meetup talks, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just never. I'm, I always make some excuse not to do. Right, and, but but you, you know you mentioned your your Vim story, right? Um, uh, and you know, so it made me think. You know, we're doing some interesting things right now, like stuff that we're just digging into that would probably be novel. Like for example, one of the topics that we're doing is sort of like how we're using bitmaps to sort of really really compress and speed up how we manage our you know sets of integers and all this kind of stuff, right? And we're essentially this is a, a problem that's being driven by scalability issues in our current architecture, right? So we're looking to sort of replace this. And and it's a space that's a bit a bit new for me, but like I know it's gonna be really cool. And like I would like to be able to go out and say, spend twenty minute talk, say, look, this is how we essentially reduced our storage size by ten X, like using this approach, right? Um, even though I didn't write the library that does it, that we're gonna use it, right? But it's more of just an experience report and you kind of like gave me permission to do that, right? Yeah. Because I, I tend to think if I'm not an expert in something, I have absolutely no business going up and talking about it, right? Um, but it doesn't but really how, how you used it is as relevant. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, because well, yeah. many I, I people use it in Korea. Yeah, I think audience are always in for a great story. So if you can tell a great story, yeah. tell it. I and think case studies are perfect. Like yeah. You have yeah. things to share. Like I, I love case study talks myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so I have to cut it here. We didn't even get into, <coughs> I think, uh, Q&A sessions, <laughs> but do not fret. So uh, what's going to happen next is lunch. Lunch is provided. Uh, Tim, is lunch outside? Oh, yeah. Outside. Oh, awesome. So uh, we're going to go grab lunch and take this opportunity to get yourself in groups and find a mentor that you want to talk more about or have them help you with your CFP. So we're going to have seven to eight people per group. So what's, happen, what's happening after lunch is that you're just going to sit in your group and your mentor will find a place for you. Um, I hope you all brought like pen and paper. Um, if not, then come see me. I have some spares. Um, and then you're going to start working on your CFPs. If CFP is too hard, work on your bio. And then mentors are here, ask questions. And then, you know, we have speakers in the audience as well. So help each other as well. Um, so take the chance to know each other and enjoy lunch. We'll see you after. What time should we come in? Um, in about half an hour. Okay. Yeah.